book. It's a real physical thing um, in this virtual world um, uh, by Pablo Sindra and uh, uh, Richard Sennett, published this month under obvious strange circumstances. Uh, tonight's event is a collaboration between the Bartlett and uh, Verso Books, and I'd like to start off by saying thank you ever so much to the Bartlett, um, uh, in particular Victoria and Anna, for hosting this uh, and, and looking after the te technology. If there are any glitches or, or problems, then that's all my fault. Um, I'm Leo Hollis. I'm the editor at Verso. Uh, it was my great privilege and, and honour to sit in Richard's kitchen and to talk through the ideas at the heart of this book and to sort of see this book come to life. Um, so this is obviously a virtual launch. We'd love to be together in a room, um, uh, but that's not where we can be at the moment. And it feels slightly that I've invited uh, 95 or so people into my spare bedroom, but uh, there are obviously uh, benefits to this. Um, it gives us a chance to look at Richard's bookshelves and to sort of see what he's been reading. And if you're having a glass of wine, it is likely to be better than that which you're usually served at bookshops. Um, so it's a real honor to be working on this book or to have worked on this book with, with, with Richard and Pablo. Um, uh, it feels as if this book is both extremely current, but it's also, let's say, it's taken about 50 years to come to fruition, to brew, if you like. Um, we undoubtedly live in disordered times, despite the fact that the dominant drive of our age is to do with efficiency, it's to do with productivity, it's about creating a lean uh, city, uh, 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 and that's not what this book is about. This book is a challenge against that frictionless uh, 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 passage that has become the sort of modern city. Um, uh, at this very moment, as we, as we sit in, in, in our private spaces, the city seems to be beyond our reach. All the kind of messy citinesses uh, of it seem to have been withdrawn from us. And, and, and I think if like me, you're missing that, missing that hustle, um, uh, this is a book very much for you. Um, the streets are empty. The eyes on the street, uh, Jane Jacobs' vision of a kind of sort of self-regulating community has been turned into a system of less, I suppose, benevolent uh, surveillance. So what are we going to do this evening? For the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I want to connect the ideas of the city that span from the debates um, uh, that come out of this book, that reach from 1968 to the uh, streets of Madrid in 2008 and hopefully to uh, a shared vision of the city in the future. Uh, we have two extraordinary guides here. Uh, Pablo is a, a lecturer in planning and urban design at the Bartlett School. Uh, he is the co-founder and partner of the urban design practice Lugadero and the co-founder of the network uh, Civic Wise. Uh, he uh, develops action research projects and radical teaching in collaboration with community groups and activists in London. And I hope he'll tell us some more about that. And he is the co-author of Community-Led Regeneration. Uh, he notes in his introduction that he came across Richard's thinking on the uses of disorder during protests in the aftermath of the banking crisis in Spain. However, this year also uh, marks the 50th anniversary of Richard's first book that was really the inspiration for this book, The Uses of Disorder. And I hope, again, Richard and Pablo will be able to talk about how this idea of a disorder is a constant inspiration. Uh, Richard is one of the most important urban thinkers in the world today. I'm sure he would be embarrassed by me saying that, but I think it's absolutely true. Um, his previous books include the Fall of Public Man, Flesh and Stone, as well as the recent Homo Faber trilogy, The Craftsman Together and Building and Dwelling. He was one of the founder, membing, uh, founder uh, members of the LSE Urban Age School, a co-author of the Quito Papers, and for decades has advised uh, urban programs for the UN. So thinking about this book, um, uh, 
it's a way of rethinking the idea of order and disorder within the city, both as a politics and I think as a practice. Um, there is no design without politics. There is nothing uh, to do with the city that isn't political. But we also need to think about political architecture. And this is perhaps, I hope, one of the areas that um, uh, we're going to dig into. I want to start off with just quickly sort of giving, I suppose, a little um, uh, 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 explanation of how the event is going to go. I will apologize that this is my very first Zoom moderator experience, so there are bound to be glitches. Uh, so we're going to talk for about half an hour or so uh, and then swiftly move to Q&A. So for anyone who wants to ask a question, please jump into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Do post uh, questions whenever you like. I think there's also a function where other people can sort of push up and down sort of questions uh, when they are uh, in agreement. Um, uh, we might try and bring the questioner up onto um, the screen as well, but that might be beyond our, our technological um, uh, know-how as well. Um, and then hopefully that Q&A will develop into a, a wider discussion. Um, and finally, the book itself. I will hold it up again to your screen. Uh, while bookshops are closed, it is still available. Um, obviously, if that is uh, your passion, you can go to Amazon, but uh, you can also go to the Verso website, versobooks.com, where you can buy the book at 50% off, um, and they will also bundle a free ebook, which you can download immediately. So, I mean, that's an impossible bargain that you cannot resist. <laughs> so, after that uh, uh, sort of uh, Brief introduction. I really wanted to start off um, uh, by uh, moving to questions to both Richard and, and Pablo. So this is uh, a launch for this book, but it also um, it's worth remembering that the orders of the uses of disorder uh, came out in 1970. It came out, that book came out very much the sort of the tumult and the fires of 1968. It's very interesting to sort of think of uh, the notions that were going on there have been an inspiration for the, uh, the coming generations. I want to ask you first, Richard, uh, where those ideas came from and why they have stuck with you across your work. And then perhaps moving on to Pablo and ask how you picked up on the ideas and adopted them in your work as an activist and as an architect. So Richard, can I ask you first? Uh, well, thinking back on this, this uh, book, uh, I realized that some of the ideas in it are um, about the city are, I hope, still pertinent today. When I wrote the book, however, what I was focused on was really the relationship between psychology and urban life. And when I reread the book today, of course, I hate rereading it because I see all the things I got wrong. But when I read it today, I see that some of these ideas about disordering order have more to do with the kind of monopoly capitalism that we live in today than they have to do with uh, personal identity. So uh, the 60s were a period in which is the beginning of what we uh, now misleadingly call identity politics, where people were trying to understand uh, from their own personal experience uh, how they related to the rest of the society. Um, and the question of people were very inward looking in the 60s. It was a time of a lot of political ferment but that ferment came out of the women's movement, came out of the gay movement. It came out of people sort of recovering something within. And my insight there was a very simple one, which is that in order to have an identity which is rich and deep and adult, it has to be complex. It can't be something simple and fixed. And that cities are a medium to create that kind of uh, complexity of experience. 
And complexity entails contradiction, disorder, uh, ambiguity, all of those things that make an adult self. When I think back, when I think forward now to the book, I see it having to do with the need for uh, complexity, contradiction, and disordering in uh, a political economy, which is more and more rigid uh, and uh, which is a, a monopolistic. I had no idea in 1968, nobody did, about uh, technology as a tool for monopoly capital. Today we know it. So that's, for me, the city is a kind of agent of loosening up control, has say, stayed constant in my thought. But what it's loosening up has moved from this kind of politics of interiority to something that is much more about the structure of the political economy. Thanks, Richard. And, and Pablo, you picked up this book and this notion of disorder uh, very much as an activist, uh, as a sort of political actor, um, and, and then as a sort of an architectural sort of student. How did all these things come together? Well, when I read the uses of disorder, um, it was back in 2008 when I was a master's student, uh, I saw kind of like two uh, connections with, with current times. One, the, the sociopolitical context and also the, the, the social movement context and also the urban renewal context. In one way, the, 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 the post-1968 situation, I saw some parallelism with uh, the 2011 uh, social movements, uh, particularly yeah. in Spain, the 15M in Spain, and also the Occupy movement here in the UK and, and in the US. Um, and, and then also, uh, I mean, which, which then uh, kind of like, um, from which emerge uh, political initiatives like Barcelona and Comú, which I discuss in the book. Uh, but then I also saw some connections in the, in the urban renewal uh, uh, context from the late 60s when Jane Jacob and, and Richard as well were identifying that modernist planning was kind of like removing the soul of the city. Uh, I saw some connections to the, uh, let's say what, what happened in the 2010s uh, decade. Um, but as Richard was saying, uh, the, the kind of order that was imposed uh, um, in the city uh, was a bit different. In this came the, in the 2010s decade, the kind of orders imposed in the city were coming from more global capital. Uh, and the kind of, uh, rather than the effects of modernist planning of building kind of like big highways and large housing estates that were kind of like removing the soul of the city. In this case, uh, the global capital was influencing urban renewal in a way that would um, displace uh, poorer communities by demolishing their council estates and, and replacing it with uh, middle income and luxury apartments. Um, but that was also being contested from different social movements, from community groups uh, organizing themselves. So that's what I, what I took. Um, and I am from that reflection and from those connections of social movements and urban renewal and, and urban design and architecture, I, I came out with the, uh, with the idea that is uh, on the book of the infrastructures for disorder. So infrastructures for disorder consist uh, not on designing disorder forms. So it's not that. So the book, uh, although the title of the book is designing disorder, this is something we debated a lot, uh, uh, the three of us. It's not about this designing disorder forms. It's about uh, designing, uh, it's about urban design that can enable the kind of the uses of disorder that Richard talked about uh, in 1970, uh, which are uh, cities where people feel more comfortable with unknown situations, with the presence of strangers, uh, where there's more tolerance, uh, where unpredictable activities uh, and situations can take place. So that was the, the idea of the infrastructure for disorder, how to produce urban design, which are, let's say, formal urban design interventions that, that can enable the informal. So there was a challenge that I put to myself as a, 
as a master and then as a PhD student, and then when I can, which I continued uh, res uh, researching in all these years, and that, that's also reflected in the in the drawings that are in the in the middle of the book on the plate section. What I what I try to to illustrate uh, how to take those ideas of disorder that Richard Sennett was talking about uh, in 1970 into actual urban design interventions. So I mean I think this 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 idea of 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 uh, you know order and disorder is 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 incredibly rich and I I I wouldn't mind unpacking that a little bit more because there are a number of binaries in many ways that sort of come through the book of ways of you know sort of I suppose lighting this relationship whether it's an open or closed city uh, Richard in your in your essay you talk about the difference between the ville and the cité the the, the sort of the physical structure of the city. Uh, as well as the kind of the behavior that happens between the buildings, the urban and the urbane, if you like. Um, and then obviously layering on top of this is, is the things that are making or ordering in terms of, I suppose, technology, in terms of finance, and in terms of, you know, political horizons. Um, I mean, this is an incredibly rich area and, and disorder strikes me as a, as a perfect sort of, you know, catch-all of these very different relationships. Uh, Richard, you talk about complexity. Is that something that, 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 that you still see or look for when you're, when you're out in the city? Of course. Um, I mean, I, uh, what was just the germ in that book, which I've tried to develop my own thinking about um, cities uh, since, 50 years, 50 bloody years, uh, is the notion that a uh, city is an open system. And an open system is one in which unexpected things happen, in which simplicities get, get disordered, and in which people learn how to deal with things that they can't control. And, um, that, it seems to me, is the most important political um, fact of our current situation, which is that we're seeing in all these right-wing movements a retreat from the notion that you can live in the midst of a complex environment, whether the complexity is uh, ethnic or whether it's class, so on. Uh, the retreat into order is a retreat from other people. And it's, it's evident to us in the US uh, uh, that doesn't need any explanation. But I think it's something that's become strong in Europe as well. What I'd like to see, I, I have to say, a sort of despair of national governments. I remain a socialist in my bones. I was always a socialist. But I despair of doing anything about making people more um, feeling that they can cope more with complex situation at a national level. I think it's only at the level of cities and at the, particularly the level of physical experience in large uh, urban domains, which are mixed uh, as people learn to manage that, that um, they become um, they become stronger human beings, but the politics of what they're doing is also uh, is strengthened as well. Um, uh, people have asked me, you know, well, how can you say that we're living in this? Um, uh, you know, this time of an incredible threat. Uh, from the uh, COVID. And uh, what I would say about that is a couple of things. The, uh, the great danger to me about where we are now is that these extraordinary powers we need in this pandemic of control are going to outlast the pandemic that as Agamben wrote about this a long time ago in States of Exception, and we're living that, that the kind of scopic controls over people's lives 
which, um, you know, we'll get a vaccine, we'll be out of this in a while, uh, will remain. And the other thing that it seems to me about this is, I think the worst way that we could deal with coming out of this pandemic is to say that we need to have more, uh, we need to go backwards to a situation which is essentially a monopolistic situation. That's, that's what we were in after, you know, it's, it's evident uh, after the financial crisis, uh, you know, monopoly benefited from it. And it'll benefit from the money and the controls that are put on this time. So in my mind, this comes together as a way that the more you feel that you can manage difficulty, that you're not going to go under, uh, that you're not going to be a victim of something, the more you are self-empowering yourself and not surrendering, as people did in 2008 and 9. You know, we bought austerity, you know? We bought all that Kool-Aid. Yeah. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, we bought all of that. And we'll buy it again, unless we think that somehow we can live in an environment which is risky, complicated, difficult, and that we can make our way in it. Because the offer of security and order as a permanent way of life is basically an offer of slavery. That's, that's my view about this. Excellent, thank you, Richard. And I think, I think we're definitely gonna be coming back to uh, discuss quarantine urbanism um, and, 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 and COVID. But I want to move to you, Pablo, and thinking about that, you know, uh, that question of uh, design and um, its right. relationship with order, um, you know, as an activist and as an architect, you know, how do you balance these two parts of, 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 of your practice? And, and how do you ensure that, um, you know, the sort of uh, your, your design part um, uh, is one that sort of promotes disorder rather than order? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I think that, mm, the well the, the the way i think the way the, the book is structured uh helps to answer that question to a certain extent uh which is uh how can urban design start from the infrastructure and and when i say infrastructure i mean the physical infrastructure both uh below ground and above ground and the social infrastructure of people coming together and building relationships and networks of solidarity, care, mutual help, and, and so on. And, and that's, I think that's, that's the reason why the book is a structure uh, with uh, talking, starting talking about the infrastructure and how this disorder could be designed from designing this physical infrastructure of public spaces on uh, underground pipes. Uh, I don't know. I mentioned the collective solar panels in the in the book and, and things like that, and, and and move from there from the infrastructure, which also in, is in connection with that social infrastructure. But it, it, in a more direct answer to that to that question, I think uh, in in my work as a as an architect as an urban designer, I've had two kind of situations of working with communities. Um, that I think illustrate very well that tension of uh, the architect that works, uh, the architect of the planner that works with, with communities. One is a situation in which I'm employed uh, or hired by a, by a local authority um, to facilitate or run a co-design process. Uh, in this case, it was for designing two public spaces. And in a way, my direct client who pays is the local authority. So in that, in that case, the, the role of the architect of the planner is to mediate between that local authority and, and the communities, the different communities involved in the, in the public spaces and the residents and the businesses. So the role of the planner and the architect there is, is to uh, make sure that you are uh, doing a fair co-design process and a genuine co-design process and that you listen to different voices and that uh, you address them and that when you discuss your design with the local authority that they address the different things that people chose 
but that's so that's one kind of situation where the uh, the architect of the planet facilitates a co-design process and, and mediates. But there's another situation that I've also in both ways um, with different communities in London, particularly with one uh, very recently, uh, which is uh, a group of residents from a housing estate uh, face the demolition of their of their of their social housing estate, and uh, and they. Uh, and they they face displacements from their homes, from the homes they are very attached with, and from the from the, the networks, their social networks of people that I don't know, people that help the elderly to uh, do their groceries, I don't know, different kind of stuff. And so they uh, call me as an architect to help them put an alternative proposal for uh, for their neighborhood that does not consider the demolition their neighborhood, but uh, but looks at other options like infill, like reinforcing those community infrastructure, uh, building more homes in a, in, a, in a different way, improving the existing homes. Uh, so I, with other people, work with the community on putting together that what we call a community plan or a people's plan. And in that case, I think that urban design and architecture becomes, uh, in alliance with community groups, uh, an act of activism as well, because you are putting together a document with your professional skills uh, that residents uh, can use to claim for uh, their, their vision to, for, 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 or to contest an imposed order in this case. Uh, which and the, is book, the, is, and the book is full of, full of examples. I mean, there, there are examples from, from all around the world that you draw on without possibly, you know, sort of uh, betraying any, any, any confidences or, or confidentiality. Can you give us some examples of what you're talking about here, where where you you have seen or participated in in sort of successful infrastructure or disorder projects? Yeah. Um, so I, I was mentioning I was mentioning the this one of the of this housing estate that I'm working in London, uh, that where I where I uh, put together and finalizing now and finalizing currently the, the the community plan that looks at the vision. Uh, uh, for the community that does not demolish the housing estate and provides the same amount of new homes, uh, but with a much higher proportion of social homes and, and without demolishing any uh, any of the 16 homes that have been put together together with the residents to, to in a way that the residents will, uh, I mean, we, we've had different levels of feedback and then you kind of like the end of the process, you give it to the resident and the residents uh, so you, uh, are the one that put it together to the local authority to claim for the uh, for for so for that, uh, so that's the main one that I've been involved and been involved also with the with the network, uh, just pays uh, in in different uh, collaborations on um, uh, related to this, particularly with my with my teaching and my research at UCL, uh, trying that my whatever the students produce or whether my research output produce uh, respond to some of these contestation to impose orders. Uh, uh, particularly in London, uh, with two main topics mainly. One is housing, social housing, and the other one is the um, uh, the, um, uh, the um, demolition of well, the, the the removal of community assets and community infrastructure, public libraries, uh, further education colleges. Uh, so I've been working with different activist groups across London in, in that. And, and normally it's to, I mean, um, I mean, there've been different kinds of collaboration. I think in the book, I also mentioned uh, the collaboration that I've been doing with the, uh, with the people, with the activists in, along the West Way in, in North Kensington in West London. And I think that um, the, the reason why I mention it in the book is also because of the, this um, relationship between what happened in North Kensington in the late 60s and what has happened today is very similar to what we talk about in the book. So in, in North Kensington, uh, uh, the, well, the, at, at that time, the, the, it was called the Greater London Authority. You know, it was called uh, the, the equivalent to the Greater London Authority. Um, I think it was GLC, Greater London Council, uh, built the, like a, a ring, well, a, a portion of the ring road that demolished and, and affected a whole neighborhood and destroyed North Kensington. So that was the kind of imposed order of the late 60s. 
and right now, um, but through the contestation of the neighborhood, they managed to bring the land to a community land trust. Uh, but then uh, that community land trust through the years, it became more in, in the hands of, but well, not in the hands, but it, it started to adopt the role more of a, of a commercial developer. And there was a group of local activists that came uh, together and formed and started to contest uh, how that community land was being managed. And so I've collaborated with those community activists and through the work of those community activists, um, so th this have managed to, right now they've managed to, uh, uh, this has actually happened after the book, uh, have uh, managed to take over uh, the, that community land trust and start to rethink it. So, some, so, so there's been this, um, but there, I this say there's, there, there's a kind of, parallel, you know, I'm working for the United Nations now, and there's a kind of parallel to the experience you've had uh, to the kind of development work we're doing in uh, cities in the global south, which is a work of undoing a kind of rigidity that was uh, imposed during the first generation of great movement uh, to cities that, uh, like Sao Paulo or Mexico City, uh, in which people were essentially warehoused. And uh, the interventions that were made by do-gooders in the North were essentially things that assumed that poverty was disorganized and therefore people's lives were disorganized and therefore they couldn't cope. And that first generation of sort of development in, in the cities to which masses of people flooded was essentially a kind of overly orderly thing which took away the kind of people skills they had in managing very fluid and very deprived situations. And now that we're in the second generation of development, we're trying to re-empower people uh, to use the skills that they have to have, uh, which are survival skills, which deal with, you know, things that don't go right, the complexities that it can be overwhelming and so on, how people can actually club together uh, and cooperate to deal with situations which are not, uh, um, cannot be dealt with by simply a maquette of order. So one of the things that has struck me about this whole project of, the word disorder could, could be, it has many uh, synonyms. It's a work of informalization, of empowerment of a certain sort, uh, is a kind of way of giving people back a sense that wherever they're placed, that they can manage complexity and that they have the right uh, to, to be agents of that management rather than it done for them. So I don't think that Pablo's story is just a story about, you know, fight. London is a very privileged city, New York City, very privileged uh, in one way, in that there are lots of resources which central authority can call up to impose order. But the, the resistance to that uh, uh, is something that I think breaks the, the boundaries of a city with lots of resources like the one that we, the three of us live in. And can I, can I follow up on that? I mean, before, before I ask a question, I'm just gonna say to, to uh, all our attendees, I know there are uh, a, a huge number of you who are, who are also Sort of activists and working in this sort of same area. So please do put your questions um, into the Q&A sort of section and we will get to those uh, very soon. But the question I wanted to ask both you, Pablo and Richards, is, is clearly that, that there is a lot of energy that goes into building communities around particular places, but how do we then scale this up? You know, how do we take these individual communities and then build it into a much larger kind of vision of the city? I, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Okay. 
Uh, I mean, I think what you want to do is have a notion of how to networks of people who uh, are working on the ground interact with each other. The word scale up is, uh, is a very, very dodgy proposition because for one thing, it takes the notion that there's some kind of best practice that you'll make more uh, ordinate to local practices which diverge on the ground. That's how the Harvard, uh, the Harvard JFK Center thinks. How do we scale things up so it's a general model? This is the, the, that's the, that's the thinking of power. And one of the things that's so, to me, so wonderful about uh, the kind of networks we can do online is that you can, you can have relatively uh, short networks that also make long-term connections between cities. That's a much better way to agglomerate something than to scale up to find a general model. Uh, I don't mean to attack you on this. I've just, I, uh, but it's a buzzword to me because one of the things that's wrecked the modern city is the notion of that somehow there's a best practice which can be instituted in various parts uh, in various cities and so on, that there's a model. That's a, um, when you start extrapolating from experience, you start eliminating experiences. And to get into the spirit of what Pablo and I are doing, it is a notion that um, there is a kind of experiential direct knowledge that people have, which belongs to them, which is not something you can abstract from, that you can suck the experience out and keep the form. So that is why um, I think we have to, that's killed the city on the left. Uh, to me, in my generation, the, the most um, uh, uh, plangent part of that was the notion that it would be a model for the socialist city, uh, which is already defeating the social and socialism. It's taking it out. There is a drawing, and that drawing or that specification will produce X results. That's exactly what we have to eliminate in urban space. Pablo? Yeah, I, I completely agree with, with Richard. And I think, That's good. <laughs> I think this, this is something we discuss in the book with, with, a, with, a, with a few examples of the fact that, that what we propose is not a model uh, and it's not something that could be scaled up. That is more is something that, that should work as a network and I think there, there are a few examples of that um, uh, that we could see even back in history. If we look, for example, at the, at the squatters movement uh, in London in the 1970s, they talked about this idea of, of having a network. Uh, if we think also of the, if we look also at the anarchist movement, it also talks about um, uh, rather than having kind of like a loose, uh central structure that would allow uh a network uh, of different nodes that cooperate um, and interrelate between each other and also the cooperative movement as well has this idea of different cooperatives that would network between themselves so there so i think the, this notion of network is something that um, that, that we do explore in, in the book and this is something that uh, uh that is it should be the direction uh, we go through. And also, I mean, I remember I've, I've been, uh, I think a colleague uh, of, of, of mine uh, asked me that, that question uh, once. Uh, I don't know if it's, I think it was Joe Penny who asked me that, a colleague, uh, ex colleague from UCL, that what would happen if, what do you think that could happen if someone, uh, if, if this book reaches the bad hands? Um, and that's a good question because if we see, what, what has happened to Jane Jacobs' uh, book. Uh, we can see how uh, different developers and all these kind of like global capital has embraced Jane Jacobs' uh, 
words uh, and you can find in these schemes that are demolishing uh, uh, social housing um, and, um, and, 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 and doing this kind of schemes, how they use Jane Jacobs' words and even re reference her. So we don't want to, that to happen to, to our book. So it's well, there's nothing that. you can do about that. That's the, the, uh, uh, this, that's... This, is, this is the appropriation <laughs> of, uh, I mean, she, you're absolutely right. She turned over in her grave uh, at uh, the invocation of her name, but there's, she's dead. And <laughs> that's the one thing I've understood about this. You know, the book, uh, you're not in control of uh, what you write at a certain point. It's what I like to call Jane washing. Um, washing, I'm yeah. going to be moving to some some questions here that uh, have come in uh, and so I'm just going to read them out. One is from uh, M. Johnson. Um, this one is to Pablo. I am one and then I will read the next one uh, after that. So there are two questions together. Um, so the first one, I am wondering how your involvement with activist groups in the situations you described are viewed by the local authorities who hire you. Is it a benefit or a challenge in your relationship? And the second one from Judith Reiser. My question is about longevity of activist interventions, including their control over the spaces they create, manage and inhabit. How can they make sure uh, their acquisitions will not be taken away from them or their achievements, sorry, will, be, will not be taken away from them by the development industry, often in cahoots with the public authority. Okay. So, Pablo, do you want to start? Yeah, um, so, so far I've been, uh, let's say, hired by different local authorities from with the communities I've worked with. So, I, so far I haven't managed that clash, but I think that my work with communities by the local authorities that have hired me have been seen as an advantage of the fact that I can work together with them and that I have experience working with community groups. Because, uh, I mean, what local authorities don't want is to have uh, kind of like a different group of activists kind of like trying to contest their proposals all the time. So it's much better to have them on board since the very beginning. And that could create some conflict, that could create initial tensions and so on, but if you get communities on board and if you insist on having them on board since the very beginning, since drawing, before drawing the first line, uh, uh, that will minimize uh, contestation and will make the, pro the process much fairer. So I think it's seen more as an advantage, but I haven't had the situation so far where I am working at the same time in both sides. Um, Although I know people that I can think of some of someone that has been on both sides and and it's an interesting tension that so far has worked well in advantage in, in that sense. Um, um, about the second question, uh, let me just reread it again. Oh yeah, about the longevity of the activist intervention. That's something very interesting and something that I that I found that I found in the uh, in the Westway uh, case study. So I'm going to illustrate it with that because I think it's a very good way to illustrate it. So when the community uh, uh, managed to uh, get the land below the Westway, which is a flyover highway in North Kensington, they managed to claim from the Lon Greater London Council. They managed to claim the land for community use. So they, they form a community land trust. So, after, so that was in the late 60s, the beginning of the 70s. So soon after that, uh, it was removed to a certain extent from them because it was, that community land trust was in charge, like half of it was in charge by the council. So suddenly the community did not have control. But there was something very important, that, at least it was very important where when Westway 23, the campaign that, that contested the trust in 2015, since 2015, when Westway 23 was born, uh, the chair of Westway 23, uh, um, uh, it, when they founded, they said that they are working um, with the heritage that activists has of the activists of 40 years before, 40, 50 years before. 
so they were standing on 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 those activists so they had the memory there that um that makes them realize that you need to be contesting uh in post order continuously so it's not something that you manage to let's say a campaign or a claim never ends because new challenges come at that time there were some challenges in the 60s building big highways demolishing uh, what they called the slums at the time and and now the different ones and just quickly following on from that there's a, a, another interesting point of reference from uh Michael Edwards, when you're building these sort of networks, and I'll read out his question, do you think that virtual meetings contain a danger of privileging sort of educated classes? Um, and I think that's both, you know, talking about sort of virtual meetings as well as sort of creating communities around particular projects at the same time. Yeah, uh, the issue with virtual meetings is that it, it leaves out uh, much of the elderly uh, and, and, and this is something that I, for example, with the, with the housing state that, that I'm dealing now, just before the housing, the, pre the presentation of the community plan with the community, the final presentation, suddenly so, so all this happened and I'm dealing with, okay, should I do a virtual presentation? Uh, I mean, I'm dealing with which should be the best way to communicate, particularly because in this housing state is mainly elderly people who live there, or there's a high proportion of elderly people. Uh, so yeah, there's a risk of that. But as Richard was saying, I think there's also a strong potential um, in, in this kind of networks. Um, and because it can connect different experiences from two different parts of the world. And I think to illustrate that, I think uh, before all this happened, since, since since 2015, I was involved in the in an in in an international network called uh, Civic Wise, and Civic Wise was born from virtual meetings. Uh, um, be, I think before Zoom or before I knew Zoom at, at least, um, and and it, it creates an experience of of these kind of nodes uh, that of network that that Richard was talking about where you can uh, exchange experience in different contexts. But I'll let Richard answer that because I think he's reflected on that in, in a few talks that I have seen him in the last couple of weeks. Well, what I'd say about, uh, uh, these are a wonderful set of, of questions. Um, <clears throat> just spinning back on them, what I would say, uh, to Judith Reiser about, about uh, keeping these gains is that um, I would look at a kind of pre-question to that, which is that uh, at least with the community groups that I've worked with through the UN, people don't have much of a sense of voice at all. And it's not a matter of them just taking power and then making sure that they, they, they solidify their gains. Uh, they haven't had any presence in the city. And to have a voice at all is an enormous uh, uh, achievement uh, for people to be heard, to be recognized. Um, and, um, you know, we don't get, um, you know, the, nothing is guaranteed in life, but that's a very significant, even if something, you know, collapses after two or three years, the notion that you had agency, that you could do something is really, at least with the people I've worked with, uh, important. I'll give you an example of this. I worked with a lot of refugees in uh, refugee groups in uh, Lebanon after the civil war a uh, generation ago. And most of those people had uh, uh, representatives. Uh, representatives, God knows, uh, had voice. But the people they represented were largely pacified and scared to speak up about their needs if their needs diverged from their leaders. And that was a very practical problem in Lebanon because the, the leaders had an interest in keeping the civil war going, which lasted a long time, 14 years. 
uh, they were profiting from it in different ways. And I think for the people that they were supposedly representing, the notion that they could speak for themselves was something that was not only psychologically empowering, was just important to them in terms of the notion of being able to exit a war. And this concretized for us in terms of building schools that would mix uh, Christians and, and uh, Muslims um, in dealing with the incursions of the Israelis and so on. So I, in a way, I think the notion of sort of sucking in your gains is again, it's a, it's a kind of privileged way of thinking about, about agency. And, uh, for most people, I, I think it's, it, it's something else. I'm very sensible to Michael Edwards' question about face-to-face -face versus networks. Um, I mean, that's, it, it's a real issue. All I can say from my own experience, practical experience, is that it's, again, useful for people if you're building a health clinic in Mali and you can identify people who have built something like that in Indonesia or in Vietnam, it's useful to be able to make a connection to them. It's not a substitute for working locally, but it is a way of you're not alone and you're sharing uh, knowledge. The thing about face-to-face, -face, and this comes back to the pandemic as well, is that one of the things that face-to-face -face does is that when your body is fully present to somebody else, you are fully present to them. For instance, this meeting, it only takes a flick of a mouse and it's over. Whereas if you're in a physical public space with other people, you have to learn to navigate that. And rather than say, you know, about our condition now, oh, it's all over. You know, no more crowds, you know, no more density. Everybody is going to have, uh, you, know, you know, is going to be in this little bubble. The notion is how can large numbers of people interact with each other so that they're aware of each other's bodies and that they do the things that are good uh, by being together. Uh, without feeling that they're constantly at risk. And we'll learn that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of garbage about, about the pandemic in terms of urbanism. That the city is over, we go back to this kind of atomized suburban existence. This again, it's a language of power and privilege. What we need to do is find ways to be physically with each other that are, are not uh, dangerous when um, uh, something like a pandemic occurs. And that comes back to the kind of work that Pablo was doing, which is how do you create infrastructures of experience, of, of building that can change if you have, um, if you have a, you're in the height of a pandemic, how do you, like an accordion, spread people out and when the pandemic uh, uh, is over, bring them back together again? That's an infrastructural question, physical question. And that's the way in which I think this whole discussion that we're having about uncertainty and complexity really hits the ground for planners now. Because we can't give up uh, and another concern that I have, I just mentioned this, is that there's a lot of discussion about the, we know that density is something that's, you know, it's ecological, that green means more mass transit, uh, greater density, compression, and so on. How can we square that kind of ecological green density with a healthy city? And the answer to that is not to see these two things as um, an either or proposition, but something that has to be managed by flexible building structures. 
And that's what Pablo has tried to tease out in the work that's done in this book. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we're just at a moment, I, um, you know, it's not, a, I'm, I'll be in the grave soon, but it's up to your generation, Pablo, to find a way to make what's good about big cities, which is their complexity, work in situations where they, uh, new challenges arrive that, that weren't foreseen before. I think, uh, I think there's a question that comes from uh, Lugadero, which, which I think very much sort of asks for that, which is what's the role of disorder in the sort of post COVID era? I mean, if we're thinking about, you know, the lockdown and coming out of the lockdown, you know, how do we make it as disorderly as possible? I mean, you know, uh, you know, well, our assumption is going to be, it's going to have to be strictly rigid. Yeah, super order. That's power speaking. Uh, I mean, to me, the most striking thing about this has to do with the economics of how you get local communities up and running again. The high streets in Britain were dying because small shops were being suppressed by these monoliths, you know, Pratt, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and when you have, if you can revive local businesses, you rev if you revive a high street, you don't re uh, revive something that is efficient. It's something where there's a lot of conflict and there's a lot of competition. And oftentimes there's a lot of duplication. I live next to the Diamond District here in London in, in Hatton Garden, uh, which is very disorderly uh, place in a way, but it's got a lot of social cohesion. People can, uh, are arguing with each other all the time. They're, comp they're competing, but it's a, live, uh, it's, a, it's a live economic community. And one of the things that really worries me about coming out of this crisis is that the kinds of order that's necessary to keep people at a physical distance from infecting each other, which is a super numerate order, something from the top dictated, will then be the ways in which people see that they recover from the pandemic. That is that you need order uh, imposed from above on the post pandemic city. And uh, it's been a great surprise to me to see in, in Britain how disposed the right, this Tory party, which is supposedly a party of free market, is to these totalizing conditions of order imposed from the, the top. Um, so it's a real question. I think what maybe sticks in people's gullet about this is the notion of disorder seems to people something that is um, threatening. And once we understand that it's life, that this is what we have to deal with constantly in life, and that we, there are skills that we have for dealing with complex disorder, then it takes on a whole different and much more positive, in my view, much more positive meaning. And uh, the one thing I'd also like to say about this, the reason this book is called Designing Disorder is because in the environment we live in now, the default position is monopoly. You have to design disorder. You have to put noise in the system in order to defeat that default position, uh, which is big government, big corporations, you know, the whole, all the sins of global capitalism. And the way to do that is by disrupting, uh, uh, by sort of gridding the machine. It's why I don't like many of their techniques, but I understand totally what Extinction Rebellion is on about, you know? To challenge the system, you have to first 
get in a situation where you're dealing beyond the pieties of that system. And that's why we use the word designing disorder. It's I, not I, natural. Disorder is not something natural. An open system is not natural. It's something that has to be made. And that's what our book is trying to do. Thanks, Richard. Can I turn to you as well on the exactly same uh, topic? Uh, so I think uh, something that we discussed on the book that I think applies very well to this um, COVID-19 pandemic situation is uh, building a, a physical and a social infrastructure that is uh, collective and it's open-ended. Uh, open-ended means that, uh, as Richard was saying, with that is that is flexible, adaptable, that it can change uh, in in different situations. And, and in the book, we provide some examples of, of, of what it means to build uh, this collective infrastructure. That could be uh, it could be a housing cooperative. That could could, could be uh, collective. Uh, solar energy and this collective infrastructure create I mean enables a social one a social infrastructure uh, that allows for or, or that facilitates uh, creating relationships of solidarity creating a mutual help uh, and provides an additional level of uh, welfare from the one that, that must be provided from the basic needs that needs, must be provided from the state but these this, um, let's say, informal networks or informal infrastructure uh, provides uh, this second layer of welfare uh, that provide this mutual help. And this is happening to a certain extent during the pandemic. So we've seen uh, digital networks of, of mutual help uh, that have emerged spontaneously online where, uh, where their neighbors that help uh, the elderly neighbors bring in the grocery or, or I don't know, or creating, I don't know, international communities of, I don't know, of yoga teaching, I don't know, a lot of uh, uh, giving and taking on people connecting with people they have not talked to to many years. Uh, so that we've been, we've seen a lot of uh, relationships of solidarity and mutual aid that have come just from staying at home. And if after the pandemic, we maintain and we enhance and we strengthen this both physical and social infrastructure, um, uh, we could be uh, more prepared for future pandemics or uh, for what is coming as well, which is the, the climate emergency uh, that will hit in a similar or in a much worse way than, than this pandemic has hit. Uh, today. So I think that that's also quite important. And that's an um, amazingly powerful way to end. We have uh, rushed to uh, past seven o'clock um, and we've barely sort of scratched the surface. Uh, there are a number of, uh, you know, more fascinating questions about the law, about smart cities, about, uh, you know, the amount of energy that is needed to keep this going. Uh, questions of resilience, um, but I fear that we probably need to wrap up now. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's been here. Um, uh, I would love to see you again in the real world, um, uh, physically in, in a space, and hopefully we'll get together and talk about this book again all together. As a reminder, here is a, a copy of it, and you can have one too uh, if you uh, go to versobooks.com. Um, or uh, any other good uh, independent online retailer. Um, I want to say thank you to Richard and Pablo, uh, both for the book. And if anyone has got a glass, please raise it to them now um, uh, and to celebrate the, the launch of this terrific book. I think it's going to be a classic. It will last for another 50 years. Um, so uh, uh, I'm really pleased that, that we've been able to come together uh, around this. Um, and I think this is the beginning of the conversation. I mean, let our lives become increasingly disorderly, is what I say. But thank <laughs> you very much, Richard. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. And thank you to the Bartlett as well for hosting uh, this webinar. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.